right, all right, all right. Good morning to all of the Emmanuel family, Spring Lake Park, Lakeville, Elk River, Maple Grove, and those joining online. How many of you love Jesus today? You love him? Come on. Hey, we've been in a great series called Fearless, Living Courageously in a Fear-Filled World. And I hope that your groups have been uh, filled with conversation. You're uh, diving into the Word of God and, and thinking, you know, Lord, He's going to make me fearless. Turn to the person next to you and say, He's going to make you fearless. <laughs> and today, we have the opportunity for this week's message to have a guest communicator. He's an, a pastor and an author John Burke has written two, multiple books, but his most recent book is called Imagine the God of Heaven. And he has some of the most cutting edge research on near-death experiences and taking real stories, but also connecting it to eternal truth and the word of God. And I'm so excited for you to hear from him today. He's a friend of mine, so that means he's a friend of yours. And, uh, and I'm so excited for you to hear it because God is gonna do something in your life today. And of course, all of his books are available on Amazon. Uh, we may have some in the lobbies at each location. And if you wanna get one, you can do it afterwards or you can just search it on Amazon. Imagine the God of heaven. I just read Imagine Heaven, the book that precedes that, on the beach this week. And uh, it was fantastic. I listened to it on Audible. It's a great way to listen to the word. But and when we go into, we're going to go to a little bit of a video here right now. And when we come out of the video, would you give John Burke a great big Emmanuel welcome? I grew up in Council of Iowa in a Jewish family. My dad's an atheist, a hardcore atheist, and my mom's an agnostic. Despite my parents, I had always believed in God, always. It was spring and I was 16. My horse reared up, fell over backwards, and as she hit my chest, I immediately left my body. I was up 30, 40 feet in the air. I just left. I knew I was dead. There was a light over my shoulders and it was illuminating everything in front of me. As my Hindu belief, I thought if I die, then that should be it. Maybe I'll come back as another, another living thing in this life. But it did not happen. I heard food blue, food blue. I asked the doctors what, what actually happened. He said, well, they could not revive your heart. A bright light was appearing before me. I knew that light had superior authority superior power. I knew it was a divine light. I fell in love with that light. I was born in Rwanda to the parents with a different ethnic backgrounds. One Otto, another one Tutsi, mixing with the Islam and the tradition ancestry worship. I was diagnosed by blood cancer. The doctor said that uh, this cancer is on fourth stage and they cannot be here. When I died, I found myself in a very big, in a very big room, a pattern in This white garment was very shiny, shiny, that kind of sunshine pierced in my eyes. When all the COVID situation was happening and I was extremely sick, I just knew that I was gonna die. And I started floating on top of my husband's head and I'm looking at my body. I was just like, am I dead? And I started screaming, God, please forgive me. Cause I realized he was real in that moment. I knew that there was something missing. This light pops bold, like seeing the sun without burning. I knew that that was the voice of God because of the authority and the love. It was like, I am who created you. I just knew that I was made by this. Well, good morning. Well, good morning. It's great to be here at Emmanuel on all, all your campuses. Nate's become a, a good friend over the last couple of years, and it's just great to be here. And, and you just heard from some of the many people I've personally interviewed who clinically died. They had no heartbeat, no brain waves, and yet they came back saying they were more alive than this life in a place more real and beautiful than earth has ever been, and in the presence of a God of light and love who they never wanted to leave. 
And that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. Now, I know some of you are already thinking, oh, this is just weird. I mean, this guy talks to dead people. No, I talk to them after they're alive. They're very alive. And not only that, this is actually not weird. It's more normal than you would ever believe. Do you realize that in 2019, a study was done by the European Academy of Neurology across 35 countries, and they found that 5% of the population had had a near, what's called a near-death experience when they were clinically dead. They came back saying similar things. Now, that's millions of people all around, uh, all across the globe. And I believe that God is giving these as testimonies, testimonies of his great love and grace offered to all people of all nations. Now, if you're still skeptical, I get it. Uh, when I first started studying these, I was a skeptical engineer. Um, I was an agnostic. My dad was dying of cancer. Someone gave him the very first research that coined the term near-death experience, and I picked it up, and I, and I started reading it. I couldn't put it down, and at the end of the book, I said, oh my gosh, like this God Jesus stuff may be real. Like I said, I was an agnostic, but so many were saying the same things. Um, over the next year or so, I started reading the Bible. I came to faith in Jesus. And over the last 35 years, I went from a career in engineering and to ministry. But I've also studied well over a 1,000 of these cases. And in 2015, um, I wrote a book called Imagine Heaven, like Nate said, that takes the commonalities of these experiences and shows how this is exactly what the Bible has been telling us about the life to come all along. And then more recently, I wrote this book, Imagine the God of Heaven, because of all the people I interviewed, they would consistently say that of the wonders of the life to come, of the beauty of the life to come, of all the great reunions, nothing could compare to just being in the presence of God. That he is the love you've always wanted. And that's what I hope you'll see today. Now, I know some people will say, but how do you know that these experiences are not just hallucination or like endorphins flooding the brain as someone dies or, or, or maybe an anesthesia or anoxia, lack of oxygen, or just a trick the brain plays? And I don't have time to go into it fully today, but in chapter two of this new book, Imagine the God of Heaven, I list the 10 um, points of evidence that convinced me when I was a skeptical engineer, but also has convinced many skeptical medical doctors that this is grounded in reality. Like when people leave their body, they are there in the room observing their resuscitation many times. And when they come back, they can make verifiable observations, things that can be studied that show this is grounded in our reality. And second, when people blind from birth have a near-death experience, they can see. And not only that, they see the exact same things that sighted people do all around the world. And third, sometimes when people are on the other side, they meet people who have died, but they didn't even know they had died until they come back, and then they discover they were deceased. And seven other points of evidence that you can read for yourself. But let me ask this, has God just started revealing himself in our age of modern medical resuscitation and NDEs? Of course not. No. And that's really what I'm trying to show in the book, that the Bible is actually God's love story with all nations. That, that from the beginning, God told us he created every person on every continent for a love relationship with himself. But all of us have rejected God's love and guidance at some point. And yet 4,000 years ago, God began a plan. In fact, before any of the world's religions were put into a sacred writing, God claimed to, to show up to Abraham and Sarah saying, I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. God's always had all nations in mind. And he, he raises up the Jewish nation to preserve the scriptures and, and show his historical reality, but also foretell of this time when he will send this Messiah who would pay the price for all people of all nations to be forgiven. And of course, Jesus came and claimed to do that. And then in the last book of the Bible, John is, says he's taken up in a vision to heaven and says, 
he saw a vast crowd, too great to count, from every nation and tribe and people and every language standing before the throne and before the Lamb, Jesus. And then there's a great wedding. (laughs) It's very wild, bizarre, mysterious, but this whole thing is God's love story with every person of every nation. And that same God says, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. And through these NDE testimonies, God is confirming that that, in in fact, is true. And I brought about eight uh, with me that you can see on video of the 70 that are in the book, but watch what they have to say. My dad had a mantra, there is no God, there is no heaven, there is no hell. Jesus Christ is the biggest hoax ever perpetrated on mankind. My heart hit my chest. I was up 30, 40 feet in the air. I realized there was a person standing right there. And he moved forward, and I looked at him, and he looked at me, and it's like, oh, Jesus. I was not thinking, what is a nice Jewish girl like me seeing Jesus? No, I knew this man. I saw him from the time I was formed in my mother's womb, he had been with me. You know, just when I used to talk to God at night when I was a little kid, he'd been there. He'd been there sitting by my bed. I saw that. I can't explain how God can be a light, and God can be a man, and God can be love. I, I can't explain it. I can't. But that's what I experienced. They even called me, Karina, come, come. They were celebrating me. I'm like, me? Out of everybody? And I kept saying, God, I don't deserve you. I'm filthy. Send me back to hell. I know I was going there. And he said, come, I love you. I knew I was home. That is home. When I died, I found myself in a very big, in a very big room. A person entered, wearing a, 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 a white garment with the sandals, you know, holding his hand, you know, showing them to me with the very, these very big holes into his heart. He told me, I died for me. You are among those I died for. Never deny it again and tell this to everyone. I woke up, people, had come for party. So I started shouting, Jesus is in in front of you. I'm seeing him. He is there. He's the one who has brought me back. I fell in love with that light because it was protecting me from any harm, taking me somewhere safer. The light stopped, and I saw that light was shining on top of a beautiful compound. Inside that compound, or complex, I should say, is There's a lot of mansions, big buildings, absolutely gorgeous, square-shaped. It is very high walls, and I saw there's 12 magnificent gates there, beautiful gates, many angels. They're protecting that gate. I knew I was looking at the kingdom of heaven. I saw there was a huge throne. And on that throne, there was the Almighty. I knew he was the Almighty. I knew it automatically. His eyes were like lightning bolts. And all the sins I committed in my life was flushed before my eyes. So I kept repeating the same thing. That Lord, please forgive me. Please forgive me. And then finally, he spoke to me. He's voice was full of tenderness, mercy, and the grace. He said, I'm sending you back to the earth. When the Lord spoke to me, I experienced the love, tenderness from him that I did not expect. Just a few short distance from him on the on that platform level, I saw a very narrow door or a narrow gate that was open. And that is the only gate through whom I can enter into the kingdom of heaven. I asked the Lord, Lord, when you see me again, please tell me how I can go to this narrow door. This next time when you see me, Lord, I want to go to the narrow door. Now think about this. 
Why would a 16-year-old Jewish girl who was told her whole life that Jesus was a hoax, when she dies, claims she saw Jesus and she knew he was the God that she had prayed to since she was a little girl? Because there's only one God. And why would a, a mom, a Muslim mom from Rwanda, come back proclaiming that Jesus saved him out of this hellish place And then he becomes an Anglican pastor who has had seven attempts on his life because he will not shut up about Jesus. And how do you explain a Hindu manufacturing engineer who had never read the Bible at all describing the same city of God that John describes in Revelation 21, where he says, so he took me in the spirit to a great high mountain and he showed me the holy city. It shone with the glory of God The city wall was broad and high with 12 gates guarded by 12 angels. It was square, as wide as it was long. And Santosh came back seeking this God. He he said, this was not like the gods I learned about in, in Hinduism. Who is this God of love and compassion and tenderness? And he was praying daily, God, I want to know you. And do you know that two years later, his daughter who was a choral major in college, was invited to sing at an Easter, um, an Easter presentation at a church. And Santosh went to hear her. And when he walked in, he felt the same loving presence of God. And not only that, here's what the message was on that day. You can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate. Matthew 7. And John 10, where Jesus says, I tell you the truth, I am the gate for the sheep. Yes, I am the gate. Those who come in through me will be saved. Santosh goes home and starts reading the Bible, and he told me everything I experienced was in this book. And he became a follower of Jesus and a dear friend of mine for many years. And three weeks ago, Santosh went through those gates. God brought me testimonies like this, 70 of them from every continent, from Tehran, from Singapore, India, China, Africa, Australia, all over the globe. God is showing his great love and grace offered to all nations. He's showing what Peter discovered. When God saw the heart of Cornelius, a Roman soldier, praying to him, and Peter, he sent Peter to him, and Peter said, I see very clearly that God shows no favoritism. In every nation, he accepts those who fear him and do what is right. And this is the message of good news. And Peter goes on to explain, Jesus is the one all the prophets testified about saying that everyone who believes in him will have their sins forgiven through his name. Now, this confuses a lot of Christians, I find. And they they often will ask me, what are you saying? Are Are you saying that everyone goes to heaven? No, not at all. In fact, do you know that of those who come forward talking about their near-death experience, 23% had hellish experiences. Not only that, half the people you're hearing from today first saw the reality of hell before they experienced God and the reality of heaven. And and that's a very important point um, that, that I want to make is that You know, these NDEs are not eternity. They're not crossing over into eternal life or eternal death. You know, one of the commonalities is NDEers said that they came to a border or boundary. They knew they couldn't cross and still come back to earth. So whatever this is, that's why they can still make a decision. But this is just a peak. And they're not seeing it all. That's why I don't advise you to to get your theology of God or heaven from near-death experiences Look at the scriptures. But they are confirming something. They're confirming a peak into reality. But it's not all of it. It's kind of like Mount Rushmore, you know? Uh, Everybody knows this side of of Mount Rushmore, right? We've always seen that. But there's another side to Mount Rushmore that people haven't often seen. (laughs) It's not that pretty, is it? And, and so here's the thing. NDEs are, are just a peek into the reality of what's to come. But they are not crossing over into eternity. They're just showing us the, the reality and the truth. It's kind of like if I visited Buckingham Palace, right? 
I can go see the place, but that doesn't mean the royal family is ready to adopt me and let me live there forever. That's what an NDE is like. Now, we shouldn't be surprised as followers of Jesus that people see this brilliant God of light or even see him as Jesus. After all, the apostle Paul, remember, he didn't believe in Jesus. He was on his way to arrest and have Christians killed in Acts chapter 9 when the same brilliant God of light appeared to him. Go read it. And he says, who are you, Lord? And he says, I'm Jesus who you're persecuting. Now notice, Jesus does not explain the gospel to him. He later sends Ananias, a man, to explain it to him. And then Paul still had a free will. He could still decide, is he going to follow Jesus or not? He had a lot to lose by following Jesus as a wealthy Pharisee. And this is the same of these NDEs. They come back, and if they seek God, they find him. Um, But they still have a free will. Uh, and, And the reason God does this is because what God wants is our hearts given in love to him, and love can't be forced or coerced. All right, well, what is this God like? That's what I actually spend the majority of the book looking at. And I'll tell you, those of us who know Jesus think we know what God's like. But here's the reality. We all put God in a box. We're all finite, so we have to. So the truth is, God is far more mysterious and and great and sovereign and omniscient and omnipotent and all those huge words than you've ever imagined. So you ought to trust him, but he's also far more relatable and personable and even enjoyable and fun. And maybe you've never, maybe that hits the walls of your box. I want to challenge you to stretch the walls of the box of imagination that you have God in and see what he's really like. And the truth is, he wants an honest, intimate relationship with you. And the more you understand what God's like and how he feels about you, the more you'll want to stay connected to him every moment of every day. Watch. And I ask the Lord, Lord, please tell me what I need to do to enter. When you see me next time, I want to enter. He said, I want to see how honest, how true, how sincere you were with me 365 days a year, not just once a week. I want to see your relationship with me. What's your relationship? Once you are back to your family, I want you to love your family and love your children. The wages of sin is death. Commit no more sins. Surrender yourself completely. Should underline completely. Unto me in your daily lives. Walk with me. After this life review, he took my hand and we flew. We surfed. It was like we had this wave of light under our feet and we were holding hands and flying like Superman and Lois Lane. So faster and faster and faster. And he was grinning from ear to ear. And it was the most fun thing I've ever done in my life. I saw a light and it was getting closer and closer. And it was, it's a living light. And it's the brightest thing you can imagine, but I could look at it. It's perfect. It's blemishless, infinite in its scope. And that light was love. And Jesus took me directly into the light And the next thing I knew, I found myself sitting on God's lap. And I have a granddaughter, a two-year-old granddaughter. And, you know, if she needs comforting, she'll sit on my lap and bury her her face in my chest, and I'll put my arms around her, and she'll, she'll have her arms around me. That's what I was doing. I was like a little kid. And I buried my face against his chest, and I put my arms around him, and he had his arms around me, and I never, ever wanted to leave and everything in my body started shutting down. We have the documentation and the timing that my heart and my lungs, I was considered clinically dead for an hour and 45 minutes. And I knew Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. I found myself leaving my body and going toward this light, and I knew that's where Jesus and the Father is, and I wanted to be with them. And when I first came in, I remember there was a forest right before me. And when I got on the other side of the forest, that's when I saw Jesus Christ. He was real bright. 
brighter than any light I've ever seen, even the sun. And probably what amazed me is I could look at him. And I went down on my hands and knees. And I said these words, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Only reason I was there is because of what he had done. Somebody always said, well, did you see the nail print? I said, I saw him, but that's not what I was concentrating on. What I was concentrating on is the love that everything was coming out of him for me, like I was the only one he loved. Anybody I thought of in the, in the switch of my thinking, all of a sudden I saw the love for them like he only loved them. And I came to understand that God Almighty goes out and creates love for us that only we can receive. And that's what I was receiving, that love that God had made for me. Now that light come, coming off of him, I remember it wrapping itself around me. Someone asked me one time, was he hugging you? I said, everything about him was hugging me. And you know, God is far more personal and loving and relatable than you've ever imagined, even fun. And so we've got to stretch our imagination. You know, the truth is God is the most understanding being there is. There is no one who gets you more. What if you had a best friend who had been through every single moment with you and understood everything about you and yet still liked you and cared about you? Well, guess what? That is who God is. And that is how he feels about you. And the Bible tells us that Jesus understands our weaknesses for he faced all the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy and we'll find grace to help us when we need it most. See, not only can God relate to you, but he's kind and merciful, just like Santosh and Swedik realized. And you know, there is nothing too great and nothing too small for you to take to him. He cares about everything. You know, people will say things like, well, there are 8 billion people on this planet. How could he care for me? Because he's not like you. He's so much greater than you. And so he uniquely cares for you. Or uh, there are billions of people praying, how could God hear or care about my prayer? Because he does. And you see, that's, that's another thing that I try to help people see. God is mystery and majesty. You have to stretch your imagination. God is so much greater than we've imagined. You know, there are all these words in, in scripture that explain this. God is imminent, it says. Now, that means he's always with us, but he's also transcendent. He's, he's far beyond it all. It says in Ephesians 4, there is one God and father of all who is over all, in all, and living through all. Which, which means that God is the very life force that keeps you and all of us and everything going. And he's infinite. So he's everywhere all the time, but he's also over all. He transcends. He's beyond the universe that he created. And in the book, I go into all these, these terms that, you know, maybe, maybe you've read in the Bible, like omniscient and omnipotent and omnipresent and holy and eternal and infinite. And we read those words, but do you understand what they mean? Because if you did, You'd be in awe of God. You know, there, there was this one 12-year-old girl, Suzanne, who had a near-death experience. And, and when I interviewed her, she said, you know, all those words like that, you know, they, they mean something. And when I saw what they mean, all I could say is, whoa, just whoa. And you know, you know what was fascinating is Suzanne, this 12-year-old girl, and Heidi, who was 16 when she had her near-death experience, both described experiencing one God, but they also experienced the Father and Jesus and the Holy Spirit, yet neither of them had any biblical background at all. It's amazing. And, and I go into this mystery of the, of the Trinity and how indie ears can help us actually understand a little bit better. Because, you know, when we talk about the Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit, three persons but one God, that sounds like a contradiction to us, Right? But that's because we're finite. We're limited by three dimensions of space. So I put an analogy in the book. Imagine if I created a flat two-dimensional world so they can only move side to side and back and forth, okay? And what if I stuck my three fingers into that world? So it would, it would look like this. If you can, so I stick my three fingers into their flat world. They would see me like, like this. They would see me as three 
round slices of those fingers. You have the next one? So they'd see me like that, three round slices. Now, what if I said to them, I'm not actually three separate slices, I'm actually one being. But that would be a contradiction to them because in a flat world, three slices can never stack up an arm into one being because there is no up. So it's a contradiction. Well, what if beyond our three dimensions of space and one dimension of time, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit connect up into one God, but beyond our finite understanding. You know, funny, funny little story. When I was writing the book, I was in a writing deadline, and I, you know, I wrote this, but I realized I need a graphic, and I didn't have time. My son-in-law is in, in, computer, in computers and all that, and he's really good uh, with computer graphics. So I call him up. I said, hey, I need a computer graphic. Can you make this for me by tomorrow? And he sends this back to me. And I, I thought it was a computer graphic. And, you know, the book's now being translated into multiple languages. And, and, and he told me afterwards, he said, no, um, I didn't have time. I actually just took a picture of my hand when I was in the bathroom. I was like, that's your real hand? And why in the bathroom? <laughs> and, and so I joke with him now, well, if, you know, if high-tech sales don't work out, you now have experience as an international hand model. So you got that going for you. He likes to say, I had a hand in that book. You know, Dr. Ron Smotherman was a neurologist and psychiatrist who uh, one of his patients had a psychotic break turned on him and stabbed him 13 times. He showed me the scars through his neck. Right before the 14th blow to his heart, he said it was like time stood still and there before him was this God of light. And listen first as as Dean Braxton and then Ron describe the mystery and majesty of this God. Watch. People always talk about a throne room. It wasn't a room like people think it is. Because to me, it was more of um, being out in nature. I was there when we all gathered around the throne of God to tell our Father how much we love Him. This was not my belief system. I didn't even know it was in in the Bible at the time, but he sung a love song back to us, each and every one of us. When I was talking to him, I was talking to Jesus and also the Holy Spirit. It wasn't like they were all together, but you could not separate them in the sense of communication. The fullness of the Father is inside Jesus. The fullness of the Holy Spirit is inside of Jesus. The fullness of Jesus is inside the Father. The fullness of the Holy Spirit is inside the Father. He is one. You know, it's not one like we think is one. Some people say in the Trinity, you know, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. No one thinks that way there. They're just one. When God shows up in your face like a bomb blast, it really gets your attention. And I'm standing there in awe with a, with a knife aimed at me, by the way, and time stopped. All I know is that God showed up as a light and the light was roiling with energy, as you would expect if you were up close to, say, an an atomic bomb. What was roiling even more was the love that came with it. It was, I'm sorry, I I have a hard time talking about this. And in one single instant, all of his qualities were in my face. God's overarching quality is love. Everything is contained within that, his knowledge, uh, came very suddenly as, as an image of a library filling the universe. His power was undisputable. The joy is it will make you happy for a lifetime. I can't think about it without getting full of joy. His authority is so great that um, you would follow any instruction, kindness, Um, You probably know someone who is kind. If you can imagine that kindness magnified a thousand times. Humor is, is something rather surprising. You don't expect God to show up ready to, to, to laugh it off. Purity, He is so pure. It puts your own condition in stark relief. You can see that you're not that. And there's, and there's humility. If I had his qualities, I would be so proud 
you know, but he's not. He is humble. Such humility. He's humble. You know, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And then he said, come to me. Come to me, all of you who carry heavy burdens and are weary, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and let me teach you because I'm humble and gentle of heart. You know, if you imagine God as a taskmaster, demanding, just hard to please, you need to let him out of that box. That's not who he is. So many of us don't follow God because we think he's sitting up there, you know, just kind of watching us with a scowl. And saying, Anybody having fun down there yet? Well, cut it out. Get back to work. And, and no wonder you don't really seek God daily. It's not who he is. God is joyful and even enjoyable. Like Ron said, he's even humorous. He's a fun person to be with. Does that surprise you? Does that hit the wall of your box? It did mine. I'll be honest. You know, when, when Heidi, who I've known a, a number of years now, first told me, you know, that when she was a 16-year-old girl, that Jesus takes her on this wild ride, surfing this wave of light, almost at the speed of light, I was like, mm, yeah, probably not. <laughs> I don't believe everything they tell me. I look for commonalities, saying it over and over again, and then alignment with the scriptures. So I kind of put it on a shelf. And then I interviewed this 13-year-old girl who says almost the same thing, that Jesus takes her and they're flying. It was the funnest thing she'd ever done. And then these parents of a four-year-old who died in a hospital tell me that their four-year-old kept saying, I want to go back and run and play with Jesus in the fields again. And suddenly I realized, why not? I mean, who do we think thought up our ability to enjoy life or, or have any pleasure. Do we think we made all that up? No, the creator of life did. And he is the most joyful, enjoyable being in the universe. C.S. Lewis said, joy is the serious business of heaven. And Indy ears confirm that. And do you know in the Old Testament, God had the nation of Israel come together seven times a year. And he would say things like this. He'd say, celebrate with joy before the Lord your God for seven days. He enjoys us enjoying him. And Jesus is last night on earth said, I've told you these things so that you'll be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. And do you realize that joy is your birthright as a child of God? And you know what indie ears tell us? It's not dependent on your circumstances. It's dependent on you staying connected to God's spirit throughout the day. You know, that's just prayer. But prayer, prayer is just talking from your heart to God. And do you know that, you know, we think prayers are nothing. But in heaven, they're tangible. They're visible. And not only that, God hears everyone and answers everyone, they tell us. Maybe not the way we always want, but they're also recorded in heaven because one day he's going to show us how he answered them for our good because he is good and he delights in doing us good. Psalm 37, four says, take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Now, I don't think that means if you're happy about God in this life, you'll get the Lamborghini if you want it. Okay. It doesn't mean we get everything we want in this life. But you know what it does mean? That God does desire to give you the, the deepest desires of your heart. And he is good even to people who don't deserve it. You know, that's what Jim Woodford uh, discovered. That God is good even to those who don't deserve it. He was a commercial airline pilot. Also owned several multi-million dollar businesses. He's a very wealthy man. He had his own private plane. He had a yacht. Uh, he had a horse farm and 19 British sports cars in his garage, and none of that mattered the day he died. He had Guillain-Barre disease, and he got addicted to opioids, and he's sitting in his truck, and he told me, he said, you know when you're dying. And suddenly, he had clarity, and he realized, I've never thanked God. And he realized, 
And as his head was hitting the steering wheel, he cried out, God, forgive me. Now, Jim's a jokester. I like to joke around with him that I think you beat the thief on the cross for last minute conversion, buddy. And he said, that's who I identify with. But listen, as he describes how good God was to him, even though he didn't deserve it. I knew I was dying and I cried out, God, forgive me. In that nanosecond of death, I realized all that I had been given, all I had been blessed with, and I had never once thanked the Creator because I couldn't find proof of His existence. We talk about heaven is real, but so is hell. I cried out, God, help me, help me. I who should expect nothing because I gave Him nothing, why should He help me? Because He's the God of never too late, if you are contrite. I look, John, and these three magnificent beings are coming toward me. Very tall, luminous creatures, beautiful in every way. First one, who I later found out had been my guardian angel since my birth, since my conception. The tall angel came forward and said, would you walk with us? We walked down this beautiful 10 to 12 foot wide path lined with flowers that of colors that I'd never seen. And I think what happens is God, God knows us each so intimately, He tailors our experience to the, the life we had on earth. So for me, when we rise up, and I'm looking down on the holy city. He gave me an aerial view of, of heaven, I suppose, because I was a pilot. We came back down and resumed the walking, and, and I've always loved horses. The guardian said, James, look, and then behind a group of trees came three of the most magnificent horses I'd ever seen. And as I'm standing there, I look up in the sky of heaven, and I see these brilliant streaks of light going straight up. And I said, what are these? And the guardian said, those, James, are the prayers of your family for your soul, even now going toward God's throne. The angel said, every prayer you've ever issued, ever thought, ever contemplated, is recorded in heaven. And it's not to create an I gotcha moment. When you have your life review, when you cross through the veil and you have your life review, it's to help you understand why you made the decisions you did. But I realized I hadn't seen the tall angel in a while. And so I turned to look and the tall angel was, was bowing very low and he was facing this other tall commanding figure. It was as though this golden liquid light flowed down all sides of this magnificent figure. And the flowers that were already in bloom, when that golden light flowed over it, they bloomed again. And that light pooled around my feet, suddenly this knowledge of who I was looking at, and I'm looking none other than Jesus Christ, the Son of God, someone that I thought was just a Jewish legend. And here I am looking at this magnificent being. and. I realized then that he was re what the angel was holding up was the book of my life. And it's, it's no bigger than a cheap roadside diner menu. Mankind should have been my business. And I was just so self-consumed. And, and I was overwhelmed with sadness, shame. Jesus turned toward me. And he smiled at me. He smiled at me. When I looked into those eyes, and I saw such sadness for the way I had lived my life, but I also saw love for me and forgiveness. From that moment forward, whatever happened, I was His. When He smiled at me and I realized He loved me and I loved Him, it felt like I was the only one that He had ever created. You know, there was that instant connection and you'll all go through that. You are his child. You are his child. You're his child. You're his child and he created you to know him and love him and trust him and to walk through this life with him to experience more and more of his joy. And all he needs is your heart, your willingness. Have you ever given him your heart? You know, maybe some of you are here or you're watching um, other campuses or online and you don't know that you have a right relationship with God. Do you know that God made it so easy? It's a gift. 
All you have to tell him is, God, I want what Jesus did to count for me. I want your forgiveness and your leadership. And he says, you tell him that from your heart, he'll never leave you. And others of us, maybe, you know, we've known that, but the truth is we just kind of do a once every Sunday with God. Why don't you commit to doing life with him every day? Because that's the path to joy. Let's pray together. God, thank you that you love each one of us so intimately. You know everything about us, the good and the bad. And it doesn't stop your unconditional love. And it doesn't stop what you did for us to pay for all our wrongs so that we can be with you now and forever. And if you've never told him and you want to know you're right with God, just tell him right now, God, I want what Jesus did on the cross to count for me. Forgive me and come lead my life. And God, those of us who maybe have wandered from you or we're not really walking with you through the moments of the day, we want to recommit right now. God, why would I, why would I ever want to turn from you, the source of everything I love, of all joy, of all enjoyment, of all peace, of all hope, of all love? And so I recommit myself to you today, Lord. Help me walk with you daily more and more until we are together finally. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen, amen. amen. Thank you, John. Would you stand, church? Stand with me. You know, that prayer that he talked about, uh, there are many of you that perhaps have prayed that prayer. In fact, if you could just for a moment, just close your eyes around the room. I'm just curious for my sake, how many of you would say, I just prayed that prayer. I gave my life to Jesus. Just put your hand up just so I can see it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So many here. Go ahead and open your eyes. I just want to give it a moment for you to respond. I want you to take that next step of following Jesus. I don't want you to just hear a good message and feel a good feeling, but live a life in relationship with Jesus. And the end of the service here. In fact, I'd like to ask our prayer teams to come right now and be ready and available along the front, the altar. If you gave your life to Jesus, we got people that are, would love to talk with you. We've got a Bible we can give you. We got another book if you want it uh, on next steps of following Jesus. Perhaps you don't even understand the religious walk or what it means to follow Jesus. It's simple and we would love to pray with you. We're gonna sing a song here in a moment. And if you feel like coming, you can come even now while we're singing. And uh, if you're like, man, I don't want to, I'm not sure if I want to go up front, uh, you just take the connect card and on the back there, you just fill in that you, today you decided to follow Jesus and then give it to somebody on the way out. One of our door hosts, we would love to follow up and just help you with your next steps of following Jesus. Would you give it up for all of those that prayed that prayer today? Amen. Amen. One of the things that John talked about is our prayers are, are accumulating in heaven and the prayers of the saints before the throne. And uh, I don't know about you, but my mind was just opened up and I'm thinking, I want to live in eternity with Jesus. I want to worship him forever. And uh, if you would with me, we're going to go into a song of worship and we'll conclude the service in a moment. Just lift your hands, your worship to the Lord. We thank you, Jesus, for your love, your, your forgiveness. We thank you for your kindness. We thank you for how good you are. We ask, Lord, that you... You would be Lord in this place, that, Lord, we would recognize you. You'd open up our spiritual eyes, our, our sensitivity to recognize that you have always been with us, and you'll continue to be with us. We trust you today. We worship you. Oh, we worship you. Come on, let's sing this together. All the saints and angels, they bow before your throne. All the elders cast their crowns before the Lamb of God and sing, you're worthy of it all. Come on, lift your voice today. You're worthy of it all. For from you are all things. For from you are all things. And to you Serve the glory. Sing 
it again. You're worthy. Come on. You're worthy of it all. Saints and angels sing. 